Hi, welcome to the Harvard Art Museums and tonight's lecture, Recent Discoveries at Sardis, From Bronze Age to the End of Antiquity. My name is Kate Moran and I live in Kirkland House. I'm a junior studying English with a secondary in Spanish. And my name is Eleanor Lieberman and I'm a senior living in Adams House and I concentrate in psychology with a secondary in the history of science. Kate and I are members of the Harvard Art Museum Student Board and are delighted to welcome you to the museum on behalf of our student community. Please now be sure to turn off and silence your cell phones and help me warmly welcome Mark Elliott, Vice Provost of International Affairs at Harvard and the Mark Schwartz Professor of Chinese and Inner Asian History, who will introduce tonight's program. Hoş geldiniz, and welcome uh, to the Sardis Biennial Lecture Series. Uh, I'm Mark Elliott, Vice Provost for International Affairs at Harvard, and it is uh, my uh, great uh, delight uh, to be here today and to welcome all of you to this uh, signal event uh, in uh, uh, Harvard's uh, archaeological calendar. This uh, lecture series was established over 50 years ago, uh, to uh, keep us up to date on uh, the new finds and current research based uh, out of the archaeological exploration of Sardis. As many of you uh, will know, uh, the Sardis dig uh, was begun uh, 62 uh, years ago. Uh, we are marking uh, that anniversary now. Uh, it is one of the longest ongoing archaeological research projects in uh, the Mediterranean uh, basin, and also one of the longest uh, ongoing international projects sponsored at Harvard. And because it is an international project sponsored at Harvard, I get uh, to uh, uh, be here tonight. Uh, and uh, even better, uh, I will have the chance uh, next Monday to actually visit the site myself uh, and to see if everything that Nick Cahill has been telling me over the years uh, about the wonders of Sardis, uh, uh, whether those, all those things are true, and I'm sure they are. Before going on, I want to offer a special welcome uh, to uh, the uh, Turkish uh, Consul General, uh, Jelan Uzun Erişen, uh, who uh, has joined us tonight uh, with her husband Eren Erişen. Uh, the Consul General's office uh, here in Boston uh, has been uh, for decades uh, of invaluable assistance in supporting our research uh, in a variety of ways, uh, uh, notably through the facilitation of the processing of the permissions for the excavation and the research visas that are needed for the team every year. And on behalf of the president and provost of the university, I'd like to express our, our deep thanks for that ongoing cooperation and uh, we're very pleased to see you here uh, tonight. Um, I am told also that uh, the former Minister of Health, uh, His Excellency Recep Atak, and now a, a Member of Parliament, is also with us today. So welcome uh, to you as well, sir. Uh, and uh, thanks to everybody uh, uh, from Turkey who is here uh, that you have chosen to spend some of uh, what I understand is a National Sovereignty Day and a holiday when you really should be at home celebrating. Uh, that you have come uh, here uh, to join us, uh, and I, I'm sure you will not be uh, disappointed. The Sardis uh, expedition was uh, begun in 1958, and here we have uh, some drone footage uh, uh, of the site, and I'm, I'm counting on weather like this next week myself. Uh, this was begun uh, by uh, uh, two, uh, two people here at Harvard, uh, George Hanfman, who is professor of archaeology uh, and uh, uh, the uh, curator of ancient art at the Fog, which is where we are today, uh, together with uh, Henry Detweiler, dean of the architecture school at uh, Cornell. For most of its history, uh, the expedition was led by the late professor Crawford Greenwald, known affectionately uh, as Greeny, uh, who was a professor uh, at UC Berkeley, which is where, in fact, I did uh, my degree. Uh, but uh, Professor Greenwald maintained a lifelong relationship. He was a Harvard graduate. He maintained a lifelong relationship with his alma mater, 
uh, through the Sardis expedition that was based here at Harvard uh, uh, through his passionate and expert direction of uh, the dig. What we have learned from 60 plus years of excavation and research at Sardis, and I want to stress that this is an international team made up of archeologists from uh, Harvard and other places in the United States and from Turkey. Uh, and this includes faculty, graduate students, and undergraduate students. Uh, what we have learned and continue to learn from this site um, extends uh, beyond just archaeology. It extends into other fields as well, history, uh, religious studies, uh, classics, art history, uh, and so forth. We are very pleased uh, to continue uh, this uh, collaboration and the partnership uh, between Harvard and uh, the government of uh, Turkey, which serves as a tangible example of how the university supports uh, hands-on, practical, international experience for our students. Over the course of its uh, uh, 60 plus years, the Sardis expedition has hosted over 700 scholars and enabled collaborations with 100 different institutions uh, in fields as diverse as architecture, engineering, geology, history, photography, and others. Uh, I'm going to be paying special attention uh, to today's uh, lecture. Uh, as I say, I'll be going there myself uh, to the site next week. Um, and I would like to uh, express uh, uh, thanks to Bahadir Ildirim at the Harvard Art Museum for his uh, expert uh, stewarding of the expedition for for many years. I think a round of applause is in hand for Baha. I'm really looking forward to Professor Cahill's lecture and to introduce Professor Cahill is my colleague from the Department of the Classics, Professor Paul Kosman. Thank you, Mark. I've got the great honor of introducing our speaker this evening, Professor Nicholas Cahill, the director of the Sardis Expedition and also the Simona and Jerome Chazen Distinguished Chair in Art History at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and research manager here at the Harvard Art Museum. I first met Nick in 2006, which was the summer of my first year in graduate school. Eager to learn how material evidence could contribute to my developing studies in ancient history, I headed off to be a trench supervisor for the long summer season at Sardis. I remember vividly walking together with Nick from the expedition compound up to the Hellenistic and Roman theater, where over the following weeks, I would open a trench. As we were cresting the crown of the theater with a stunning view northward to Bin Tepe, the Lydian royal necropolis, Nick turned to me and said, by the end of the season, you will know if you're meant to be an archeologist. <laughs> by the end of the first day or so, I was fairly confident that my talents lay elsewhere. <laughs> but the experience of that season at Sardis was formative, both intellectually and personally. A daily engagement with a site of such historical significance and extraordinary natural beauty cannot leave one unchanged. And I've since had the pleasure of working with Nick and many other members of the Sardis Expedition team in my own work and in collaborative ventures. Professor Cahill received his BA from the University of Michigan and his PhD in Ancient History and Mediterranean Archaeology from the University of California at Berkeley in 1991. His, his career at Sardis began back in 1979 as the expedition's photographer, rising to become its senior archaeologist from 1994 to 2007. In 2008, following the death of Sardis's director, Crawford Greenwalt Jr., known to many of us as Greenie, a Harvard alumnus, himself and professor of classical archaeology at UC Berkeley, Nick became the new expedition director of the site, the third in its history. Professor Cahill's research focuses on the archaeology of Greece, the Near East, and especially the Anatolian Peninsula. Among many publications, he is perhaps best known for his 2002 Yale University Press monograph, Household and City Organization at Olynthos, which studied the distribution of finds at this Pompeii of Greece in order to complicate previous 
overly schematic understandings of household life. A host of recent articles extends this combination of salutary caution and creativity to studies of Greek and Near Eastern urbanism, cultural interactions between the Mediterranean world and the Near East during the Iron Age, the Achaemenid Persian Empire, and of course, Sardis and Lydia. Nick's impact at Sardis has been substantial. Under his watch, the excavation team has grown to over 70 participants, employing all the latest archeological techniques and methodologies. Recent collaborative efforts have bridged the humanities and the sciences, and include things like the study of ancient human, animal, and pathogen populations through ancient DNA analysis, the development of new conservation techniques and innovative modes of documentation, such as the drone videos we've been seeing. As co-editor of the Sardis Reports and Monographs since 2008, Nick and the publication team have ushered into print four major volumes on the Lydian masonry of Sardis, churches EA and E, the coins of Sardis, and later this year, uh, a volume on its inscriptions. He's also been responsible for a fest shrift in honor of our beloved Greenie, titled Love for Lydia. Things continue to change and advance at Sardis. An agenda for undergraduate interns has recently been instituted, and I'm greatly excited for a continuing research agenda that makes Sardis a cornerstone of East Mediterranean archaeology and ancient history. Please join me in welcoming Professor Cahill. Well, thank you so much, Paul and Mark, for those kind introductions. And um, um, it's a great pleasure to be here. This happens all too rarely, and, uh, and, it's, and it's wonderful to see old friends and meet um, so many new people here. As Mark said, last summer, this summer marks the 62nd anniversary of the beginning of the Harvard Cornell archaeological expedition to Sardis in western Turkey, one of the longest running um, uh, American excavations and one of Harvard's oldest international projects. It's my pleasure and privilege this evening to try to fill you in on just the last couple years, a tiny drop in the ocean of generations of scholars and students who have worked there. And I'm particularly happy to welcome Consul General Jelan Uzen Erishen and her husband, Eren Erishen, and um, His Excellency, Member of Parliament for the City of Erzurum and former Miser um, Minister of Health, Recep Akda, um, this evening. Thank you very much for, for joining us. Professor Hanfman founded the Sardis Expedition in 1958 as a modern archaeological research project engaging in all different aspects of the investigation of, these, of this ancient site. He brought architects, epigraphers, anthropologists, conservators, numismatists, and a host of other specialists, and he invested in the latest cutting-edge infrastructure with a new expedition compound, excavation compound, the latest in current technologies, and this brand new Willys Jeep that came in that year and which still runs. <laughs> We are proud to continue Professor Hanfman's traditions, and particularly that many of the people who came to work for him as youngsters are still working there. For instance, Teoman Yalchin Kaya celebrated his 50th anniversary at Sardis last summer. He arrived as a student, built a great deal of the marble court, as we'll see, and the synagogue, and is still the person who makes everything happen at the site. Let me back up for a moment and explain a little bit about what Sardis is and where with apologies to those of you who have heard this more than once. Sardis, located in western Turkey, was one of the capital cities of Asia. Its Roman inhabitants in, say, the second century AD were proud of the antiquity of their city, describing themselves as autochthonous, as protochthonous, first of the earth, and as mother city of Asia and Lydia and of Greece, an ambitious claim to claim to be the mother of Greece itself. Sardis looked back at an illustrious history reaching back to the earliest days of Greek myth. The hero Heracles had been enslaved to a queen of Sardis named Omphile, and more recently, King Midas of the Golden Touch had washed that touch away by bathing in the Pactolus River, which from then on ran rich with gold. That gold made the inhabitants of Sardis, the Lydians, the richest people in the world, and led them to invent the world's first coins. 
Their wealth apparently led the Lydians to establish the first empire in Turkey since the Hittites during the, second, during the seventh century BC. They conquered the Greeks along the coast and the Anatolian inhabitants as far east as the Kizil Irmak, the Hollis River. We know of this rise to power almost completely through Greek sources, and the Greeks had very mixed feelings about the Lydians. On the one hand, who doesn't admire such vast wealth and power? And on the other hand, they considered themselves above mere riches. As Archilochus, the poet, pro proclaimed, I care not for the wealth of Gyges, rich in gold. Standing at the border between Greece and the Near East then, and between Greece, between East and West, Sardis offers a unique opportunity to explore how perceived cultural divisions arose, which still frame political geography and interactions. Sardis not only stands at a crucial location in space, it occupied a long span of time, offering us opportunities to study the transformation of this city from a small regional center to the capital of a major empire that conquered most of Western Anatolia and to its famous catastrophic destruction. The last Lydian king, Croesus, wanted to expand his empire and so attacked the rising power to the east, the Persians, who were ru newly ruled by Cyrus. The story of how Croesus consulted the oracle at Delphi and was told that if he attacked Cyrus, he would destroy a great empire became a paradigm for the foolish king misled by an ambiguous oracle, because Croesus, be believing that he was bound for victory, set out to conquer Cyrus, but in the end was himself defeated. The transformation from a Lydian kingdom to a Persian satrapal capital is one of particular interest to me and in the subject of another talk. But the subject of the transformation of this city for, to a Hellenistic polis, the western capital of the Seleucid Empire, was the subject of a recent interdisciplinary project headed by Paul Cosman and Andrea Berlin, both of whom are here tonight. They brought specialists from many disciplines, history, numismatics, epigraphy, topography, architecture, and other topics, to Sardis over three seasons to research and to especially to share ideas about the Hellenistic world, and then to a symposium at Harvard on city and empire in Seleucid Asia Minor in 2017. Their publication, Spear One Land, will be published very shortly, I'm told, and here the cover. They reinterpret many different aspects of the long transformation of Sardis from an eastern capital to a Greek polis, and they carry on strongly the interdisciplinary nature of work begun by Professor Hanfmann. The richest and in many ways the best known era of Sardis is of course the Roman period when it was one of the major metropolises of Asia. The city housed two different temples of the imperial cult, one in the Temple of Artemis, the other in the city center, which we'll look at, as well as baths and theaters and the other institutions of a typical Roman city. It suffered, however, a, a swift and devastating collapse in the early 7th century AD, a time when cities all over Asia Minor were being transformed into something quite different. Occupation at Sardis did not come to an end, of course, but it was never a metropolis or a major urban center again. It still retains, however, the name of Sart, as it has since the beginning of recorded history. So faced with this wealth of history and important questions, where does one begin? When Professor Hanfmann founded the expedition in 1958, he undertook many different projects, but two of them stand out, and I won't talk of, of all of them, of course. First, he excavated and then reconstructed the bath gymnasium complex and the synagogue in the, um, the largest such synagogue in the, in, the, in the ancient world. This was a major undertaking, the first large-scale restoration of an ancient building in Turkey. It is emblematic of Sardis today and served as a model for later reconstructions, such as those at Ephesus, Laodicea, and other sites. He also, however, wanted to learn about the Lydians. After all, there are lots of Hellenistic and Roman sites, but if you want to learn about these native Anatolian peoples and the rise of the first great Iron Age empire, Sardis is the only place to do so. However, Lydian remains are generally buried deeply under the ruins of the later occupants of the city, the Hellenistic and Roman and Byzantine periods. 
Professor Hanfmann therefore followed the account of Herodotus, who says that the Agora, the civic center of Sardis in 499 BC, at the time of the Ionian Revolt, was located along the banks of the Pactolus River. Professor Hanfmann's excavations along this along this um, uh, sector's Pactolus Cliff, re revealed a wealth of early Lydian pottery. Excavations at Pactolus North found one of the earliest gold refineries. And finally, excavations at the so-called House of Bronzes it descended through 6th and 7th and 8th century levels back into the late Bronze Age, maybe 1200 BC or so, the earliest levels ever found at Sardis until just last summer. All of these sectors consist of consisted of rather small-scale buildings, one or two rooms separated by little irregular alleys, and Professor Hanfmann therefore envisioned Sardis as a sort of a ramshackle lower town without any particular organization or density, dominated by a royal palace on the Acropolis where he had excavated Lydian terrace walls um, on the north slope of the citadel. He then concluded that the city of Sardis moved in the Hellenistic period from the Pactolus to the region north of the Acropolis, where we find the theater, the stadium, basilicas, Roman temple, and other major remains within the late Roman city wall. Professor Hanfmann retired in, I'm sorry, I skipped one, um, in 1976, and Professor Greenwald took over as excavation director. Hanfmann then turned to finish his magisterial summary of his work at Sardis, Sardis from prehistoric to Roman times. This, of course, did not complete his responsibilities, our responsibilities, for publishing that work, and it would have been quite justifiable if Professor Greenwald had chosen to spend the next years focusing only on studying and publishing the results from the first 18 years of work. As it was, they brought out volumes on sculpture, pottery, coins, glass, houses, terracottas, the Bath Gymnasium complex, Byzantine shops, gold refining, and other aspects of Hanfmann's work. But Greeny also continued to excavate, and everything changed. In that same year, 1976, Andrew and Nancy Ramage, who had met at Sardis back in 1964 and still come to work at the site today, discovered during an evening stroll that a hillock that people had assumed was just a natural hill was actually artificial, made of solid mud brick. Andrew immediately recognized that this was the Lydian city wall, and Greeny made it the primary, one of the primary foci of excavation and research for the next 30 years. But it was not just the keen eye of the Ramages in identifying mud brick, but also Greenies and the Ramages' willingness to think, to rethink what we supposedly knew for certain that transformed our understanding of the site. And that's certainly the most important thing I, undertook, I learned from my mentor, Greeny, at Berkeley. He never took anything for granted. He never believed that he had the final answer, but rather followed his nose, followed the archaeology, traced the city wall around to the east, not to the west as we had expected, and discovered to his surprise that the Lydian city wall did not enclose a city along the Pactolus River, as Professor Hanfmann had concluded, but one to the east under the Hellenistic and Roman city. The Bath, Synagogue, Hob, PN, and the other excavation sectors now turn out to be outside this, the Lydian city wall. And this is now old news to most of you who have heard earlier talks, and you'll be tired of hearing me repeat it. But it does bring us to one of the fundamental questions that any archaeological project faces. What are our priorities? What do we want to learn? And especially, how do our implicit assumptions about, about history determine where we will work and, therefore, what we will find? It turned out that the area we were focusing on for 40 years was outside the Lydian fortifications, and so in recent years, we focused on learning more about the city core in all its recent periods, or in all its periods. The Lydian city, about which it turns out we knew essentially nothing, and also to investigate the long history of the urban fabric of this metropolis. At the same time, as you'll see, even after intensive work by both Professors Hanfmann and Greenwald, there's still much to be learned about the suburbs and the edges of the city, and this too continues to turn up big surprises. Well, anyway, um, we'd like to get a broad overview of urban Sardis, but with its steep slopes and its irregular complex topography, Sardis will not be amenable to the kinds of city grids that regularly characterize most Greek and Roman and Near Eastern cities of this period. 
Rather, it seems to be subdivided into separate zones based on different orientations, based largely on little, and this map that you see here is based largely on little bits of wall that are sticking up above the ground on modern field boundaries, which often follow the ancient urban structure. We don't know how this plan came into being, how its street system worked, or where fundamental civic structures were located that we know existed, the Agora, the gymnasium, the Odeon, and so forth. Now, excavation is very slow and expensive and often not the best way to get an overview of an urban site. And these aerial views and drone videos or something and so forth are, are beautiful. They're also kind of discouraging because they show you how huge this site is and how minusculely insignificant our own excavation trenches seem. <laughs> Many archaeological projects have used geophysics, um, magnetics, um, electrical resistivity, seismic conductivity, and so forth, to obtain wonderful maps of buried archaeological um, uh, features. And we've done this at Sardis since 1982, but never with very much success. Some sites, like Kerkenesta, can you see all the buildings right there under the surface. Ours end up looking sort of like burned toast. Um, but we don't give up. And last summer, a team from the 9th of September University in Izmir spent a number of weeks mapping the area around where we've been excavating using a ground penetrating radar. This technique is unwieldy. You can see the poor people dragging this heavy machine up and down the slopes. But it does give you a series of slices, which you see in the, in the uh, video there, at different depths under the ground surface, and so is able to distinguish different phases of occupation. The results they got last year were far better than anything we've gotten in the past, giving us a far more detailed image of the different phases of occupation over a rather large area. We can see individual buildings, as you see, get a sense of the depth of occupation, only to the first four meters or so, but still that's, that's better than nothing, and generally get a good sense of the overall layout of this area. One thing they don't tell you, of course, is how old each level is, and for that you do have to rely on excavation. So we focused excavation on two terraces in the very center of the city at the foothills of the Acropolis. The lower terrace, called Field 55, was a sanctuary of the imperial Roman cult, as we'll see. The upper terrace, called Field 49, was, I believe, part of the Lydian palace complex where Croesus himself lived. One of the most remarkable features of Field 49 and the adjacent hill known totally misleadingly as, Byzantine, as the Byzantine fortress, um, shown on the left, is that they were both enclosed during the Lydian period by monumental terrace walls, which regularized, organized, monumentalized, and separated this region from the lower parts of Sardis. The terrace on Biz Fort stood 12 meters high and dates to the 6th century BC, the period of the Lydian's greatest expansion. This transformation of the natural landscape by um, uh, regularizing it, by building these enormous terrace walls is one of the most distinctive features of Lydian urbanism. And we are endeavoring to find, to learn more about the history of terracing here, which established the urban structure of Sardis for the rest of its long history and the buildings that the terraces supported. So the north slope of Field 49, where we have been working, was terraced rather earlier than the, than the 6th century by a boulder wall three meters thick and now more than 40 meters high, the most conspicuous monument of Lydian architecture now visible on the city site. When it was discovered back in 1981, we believed, of course, that this was outside the Lydian city, and so we thought maybe it was an extramural sanctuary or something like that. Later, when we learned that this was actually the city center, these terraces were clues that this region was part of an elite and probably a palatial quarter. So we returned to learn more about the complex history of terracing here, and Guzine Eren um, of Boston University has bravely dug on these slopes uh, for seven seasons now. Until a couple years ago, Guzine had worked mostly uh, within the terrace wall and found, for instance, that uh, mud brick wall that you see in the video up there, um, uh, which she is excavating deep, uh, deep uh, under the ground, six or seven meters deep, and perhaps belonging to a sort of a basement for a higher structure set up above and now lost. This dates probably to the early Iron Age. 
She also then tried to learn, tried rather valiantly to determine the date of that boulder wall, uh, which was critical for uh, her own dissertation on the origin of monumental architecture at Sardis. This date has remained exasperatingly contradictory. Our opinions tend towards the 8th century BC, but there are problems, as she would probably explain better than I. Guzine then began to excavate down the slope of the hill to learn more about the history of terracing here. Excavations, as I said, in 1981-82 had uncovered a lot of rocks down there, but at that time, they were just rocks. They, we thought they were a packing or a glossy or something, obviously too thick for a, for a real wall. But Cuisine and other excavators have shown that nothing is too massive for the Lydians, and when she excavated the north slope of the hill, she found that these stones, too, belong to massive terrace walls, fully five meters, 16 or so feet thick, and built of huge borders, Boulders, I mean, a monumental undertaking requiring not only a transport of these boulders to the top of the hill, but also tens of thousands of cubic meters of fill to create the terrace behind them. This terrace wall was later reinforced with another couple of meters of boulder terraces, and Guzine's careful excavation found evidence of dating that dates these to the late seventh or the first half of the sixth century BC, the period of Sardis's greatest expansion. Last summer, when she expanded to follow these walls to the west, however, she found absolutely typically for Sardis that the wall had been entirely robbed out probably in the Achaemenid period, after the Persian capture of Sardis when Cyrus defeated Croesus in 547. This in itself is interesting. We wondered why this five meter thick wall was relatively poorly preserved, and the reason may be that it was almost completely robbed out after the Persian sack, and this adds weight to the observation that we've made in past years, that while we find lots of Lydian remains in central Sardis, we find lots of Hellenistic and Roman remains. We find nothing, almost nothing, from the period from Cyrus's capture of the city in 547 until after Alexander the Great arrived in 334. Rather, we find evidence for massive robbing of the palace and terrace walls, removing them, in some cases, three meters deep, 10 feet deep below contemporary ground level. After they conquered Sardis, then, the Persians did not simply move into the palace and continue the status quo. Instead, they tore them down utterly, presumably to reuse the structures in other, in other um, the stones in other structures, and then apparently left the whole city center abandoned for more than 200 years. Towards the center of this hill, another long-lived trench begun in 2012 and dug every year since, mo most recently by Will Bruce and Julia Judge, who is here. The theory was that this trench would uncover the continuation of the western wall of the Lydian Terrace, which you see, um, 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 which we'll look at in a, in a moment. Roman remains had mostly been excavated in previous seasons. I won't go over those now, but this is where, for instance, in 2015, we discovered a wonderful divinatory triangle with figures of the goddess Hecate and magical incantations, or characteres in Greek. And this is now published recently by the excavator Will Bruce and by Cassandra Jackson Miller. So what we were doing here in this trench was to look for the continuation of the Lydian terrace wall to the south, which we'd found in previous years. And a couple years ago, when I last spoke here, in fact, we had found a two-phase limestone wall exactly on line with this Lydian terrace wall. It was built with limestone, which is a typical Lydian material, worked with a flat chisel. What else could it be except the terrace wall that we were seeking? It made perfect sense, which again was why it was entirely wrong. Um, Julia Judge's excavations here show that neither phase is, phase is Lydian, but both are Hellenistic, dating to the eras after Alexander the Great, and built entirely out of reused, Helen, reused Lydian blocks. This intensity and monumentality of Hellenistic and early Roman remains on this hill is quite striking. We've got four or five major phases here, lasting from the early third century until 17 AD, when Sardis was utterly destroyed by an earthquake. Julia excavated very carefully a series of floors outside the Hellenistic platform with assemblages of artifacts, jugs, coins, a coin of Seleucus I, West Slope ware, molded bowls perhaps imported from Pergamon, which have added me immeasurably to our understanding of Sardian pottery chronology studied by Andrea Berlin. 
Within this terrace, just to follow up on, on monumentality, is another huge and mysterious two-phase Hellenistic structure, a great foundation built of limestone blocks weighing more than a ton each, piled up, as you can see, in this way that we call, it's, we call it a Jenga, um, in a way that never could have stood above ground. Both phases must have been subterranean foundations belonging to a building at a higher level, which is now completely eroded away. These remains give us a sense of the difficulty of interpreting the Hellenistic structures here. Um, what, what is so heavy that it requires foundations two and a half meters deep built of one ton blocks? Maybe a series of massive column foundations on a scale then with the great temple of Artemis? And last summer, we did find a, um, the edge of the second, uh, what might be the second of one of these structures. Well, so much for the Hellenistic period. I mentioned that we rarely find material of the Achaemenid period in central Sardis, but last season actually was an exception. Will Bruce un uncovered a garbage pit with a great deal of animal bone and small amounts of Persian pottery, but also an exotic, uh, an assortment of wonderful and exotic materials, ivory and bone inlays beautifully worked, scales from a suit of lamellar armor, um, at least 27 arrowheads. A few potsherds and a silver coin show that the pit was dumped in the 5th century BC, but the luxurious material in it probably dates to rather earlier in the Lydian period and is simply stuff that's been churned up from all, these intent, all this intensive robbing of the destruction level of the palace. And I suspect that this is early, as I say, earlier material. So what we thought was the Lydian terrace wall turned out to be Hellenistic, but built of Lydian blocks. But Julia, again, found the first surviving stretch of real Lydian wall worthy of the palace of Croesus, which has survived the robbing of most of the hill. This beautifully cut limestone masonry with drafted edges and rusticated centers is very well known at Sardis in elite tombs like the tumulus of Aliates and the other tombs at Bintepe, at um, civic structures such as the main gates into the city and the terrace walls excavated by Professor Hanfmann and, and Greenwald, which we believe to belong to, the, to palatial structures. However, the wall runs perpendicular to the terrace we were expecting and then seems to turn a corner. It's not the terrace, but maybe one of the massive buildings of the palace itself. Like the Hellenistic buildings, these Lydian structures are just so large that it's hard to understand them in the relatively small areas we have to work with. It reminds me always of the parable of the five blind men and the elephant. Just a couple meters north, Julia uncovered a, a schist wall, which you see in the upper right-hand corner, built of rust-worked blocks, the diametric opposite of her beautiful limestone white um, gleaming wall, but the two belong together. And you can see in the scarp behind her that there's a burned floor that connects these two walls, and in and on these floors, this floor, were found three Lydian arrowheads of types associated with the Lydians and found in large numbers in seasons, in last season, but elsewhere, all over this hill. This context of a mid-sixth century destruction level with arrowheads, walls appropriate for a palatial structure, seems to be, as a working hypothesis, the destruction debris remaining from the capture of Sardis by Cyrus. And one can imagine here the scene described by Bacchylides with Croesus in his palace surrounded by his wife and daughters awaiting the onslaught of Cyrus's soldiers. I don't mean to get too maudlin or romantic, but one of the remarkable things about working at Sardis is that one does occasionally on these chance occasions deal with the material remains of such world-changing historical events such as the onslaught of the, of the Persians, the defeat of the Lydian Empire, when Croesus managed to destroy a great empire, his own. And I still get a little bit emotional in actually handling arrowheads that were shot during this historic event. Another goal of excavating here was to learn about the earlier history of this area, and particularly the history of terracing here. I mentioned the Sardians' own pride in their, in their own antiquity. They were the first of the earth, born from this very soil, the mother city of Asia and Greece. But this is not the story that we get from ancient historians. Strabo, for instance, tells us that Sardis was founded after the Trojan War, so in the 1100s or 1200s BC. So why do the Sardians harp so much on their own antiquity? 
One answer is that everybody does it in, in, uh, back then. But archaeologically, our view of Lydia in the Bronze Age was transformed rather recently by Chris Roosevelt's uh, discovery and excavation of the site of Kaimakcha across the valley in the Gygean, near the Gygean Lake. Lake. This late Bronze Age site, middle and late Bronze Age site, larger than Troy, is believed to be the capital of this region, which is the Seha River land mentioned in Hittite sources, and the hub for a network of citadels and settlements around the Gygean Lake. And there are earlier settlements here around the lake as well. David Mitten excavated important early Bronze Age sites on the lake shore in the 1960s. Excavations at Sardis, on the other hand, had revealed only very slight remains of the late Bronze Age and nothing earlier. We then find continuous occupation at sectors, at Lydian sectors like Hob and Pn and so forth, from the late Bronze Age through the Iron Age and into the Roman period. So we had hypothesized that the focus of occupation moved from Kaimakcha to Sardis, perhaps at the end of the late Bronze Age, when so much of the ancient world was in flux and that perhaps settlement began along the Pactolus River and moved to other, more defensible parts of the site later. But this was based on very little actual data. Another goal here, then, was to investigate the early history of, of this hill, which later became the Lydian Palace, to see when it was first terraced and monumentalized, whether there were traces of earlier settlement below the Lydian fill. We had been told by geologists that this was a naturally flat-topped spur, and so a good place for early settlement, high above the plain with this commanding view. When did the Lydians begin to develop this hill, enclosing this spur with terrace walls to level the surface and, and enlarge the livable space? Will Bruce began a small sondage in 2016 and excavated through about five meters of almost sterile gravelly fill, which you see in the slide on the right. Um, which the Lydians had brought here to raise and level the terrace before building. This seems to date to the first half of the 6th century BC, at the height of the Lydian Empire, rather than earlier. And I was, I guess, a bit disappointed not to find that we had earlier Lydian 7th, 8th century BC terrace fills um, um, here. But then he began to find earlier pottery, which he tentatively dated to the late Bronze Age, and I mentioned those at the last time at this last lecture. So in 2017 and 18, we expanded and continued to dig deeper. Will dug through two meters of stratified deposits with whole pots, lenses of burning and ash, and other remains of real occupation dating to the late Bronze Age, including this wonderful nosed vessel, similar to examples from Beje Sultan and uh, ma the major Bronze Age site in the south, to the southeast of Sardis, and other characteristic ceramics. Two experts in Bronze Age, um, wait, sorry, two experts in in Bronze, Age, in Bronze Age ceramics uh, studied these, Fulia Dede Olu from the excavations at Beje Sultan, and Peter Pavuk, who works at Troy and Kaimakcha and elsewhere, um, brought different perspectives, but they both agreed that the material is late Bronze Age, perhaps 1200 or a little bit earlier, and were very excited about finding this new level at this important site. To find almost two meters of these stratified deposits gives us hope for learning much more about this early phase of Sardis' history. As the season went on, though, Will kept digging, but failed to find the bottom. The sondage just kept, it, kept getting deeper and deeper and deeper, 20, 30, 40 feet deep below ground level, and the nature of what he was digging changed. Rather than finding whole pots and, um, and gravel and, um, and organic material, ash and other remains of actual occupation, he just found coarse gravel and pebbles and sand, which was almost sterile, with just small sherds of broken pottery. And rather than being bedded horizontally as the late Bronze Age strata were, these layers sloped down steeply to the west. In fact, it was essentially identical to the Lydian terrace fill above, but much, much earlier. He finally reached bedrock at a depth of 14 meters, the height of a five-story building, and not the flat, easily buildable ground surface that the geologists had promised us, but rather a steep slope which would have been impossible to build on without terracing. 
That four meter thick level of gravel then should be the fill of the first terrace on this hill, representing the period when the Sardians first began to develop and monumentalize and inhabit this hill. And when the experts looked at this pottery, um, they dated it not to the late Bronze Age, about 1200, but much earlier, the early Bronze 3B period, about 2000 BC. We actually took a special trip to Beje Sultan to confirm this with the experts there. And unexpected as it is, they agreed that we've just added about a millennium to Sardis's long history. <laughs> now, it's obviously extremely risky to extrapolate really at all from such a tiny exposure, but that is what archaeologists do, and I shouldn't let the risks stop me, but... Be, but we have to be careful, right? First, however, we discovered this is not a naturally flat-topped hill, as the geologist had suggested, but was a steep slope. The bedrock is only a meter deep on the eastern side of the hill, 14 meters deep on the west. Without terracing, this hill would not be habitable. And so the sloping, sterile, imported artificial fills of sand and gravel with early Bronze Age pottery are so similar to later Lydian terrace fills. The Lydians are great at terracing, and um, that even though we haven't uncovered yet a terrace wall to retain them, um, it's reasonable to hypothesize that there must be one there somewhere. It's significant then um, it's significant enough to have discovered early Bronze Age remains at Sardis for the first time. Um, we've lengthened the, histories, the history of the city dramatically, but even more significant is, I think, that this is not simple occupation, but that the inhabitants are transforming the natural landscape in such a characteristically Lydian approach to urbanism. And that just as the Romans had lived in and adapted the remains of older civilizations, the Lydians seem to have done the same thing. How can we test this hypothesis? We would like to discover that hypothetical terrace wall that I can so confidently dot in out there, but that would involve removing many, many, many meters of later occupation. We'll keep at it next summer, but it's going to be very frustrating. An important question is whether this is an early Bronze Age terrace or whether this is a later terrace where they were just digging up Hot, uh, dirt that happened to have early Bronze Age sherds in it. Um, and we'll address that next summer by doing a series of optically stimulated luminescence dates, which can actually date the deposition of sediments rather than um, the sherds that are, that are found in them. Um, and that should give us independent dating evidence for the history of this early terrace. In any event, it does force us to reconsider that hypothesis that, that the Bronze Age capital of this region was at Kaimakcha and that occupation at Sardis only begins uh, in the late Bronze Age or early Iron Age, as ancient historians wrote and as the archaeology seemed to confirm until last summer. Sardis, too, may have been an important settlement even earlier than Kaimakcha. Our excavations on Field 49 have contributed greatly to our understanding of the earliest periods at Sardis. This hill was densely occupied in the Roman era, but for the most part, the remains of that period are a little uninspiring. A lower terrace, however, offers us important remain in insights into Roman Sardis. In 1981, again, we discovered the corner of a temple called the Wadi B Temple and concluded that this was a temple of the imperial cult, largely thanks to Clive Foss's interpretation of the inscriptions there. We returned to this area in the 2000s in order to put the temple in its larger urban context. We learned that it, had been part, that it was part of a great sanctuary terrace, which we call Field 55. The temple had been badly destroyed, but many architectural fragments and inscriptions and sculptures and the like had been reused in late Roman constructions on the east side of the terrace, especially in what seems to be a fortification of the 6th century AD and the houses around. At the bottom, you see one of the Corinthian figural capitals from the temple and a block of its architrave, which bears an inscription that seems to name the Roman Senate and so identifies it as a temple of the imperial cult. After four years of excavation, we cleared a road leading through a gate in the late Roman fortification, and this suggests that this region of Sardis was separately fortified in the 6th century AD. It was quite clear from the beginning that these structures had been destroyed by a massive earthquake, leaving the blocks sort of toppled like dominoes, and the coins and pottery from this earthquake destruction dates it to the early 7th century AD. And as we'll see, we found that same earthquake elsewhere in the city. 
On top of this hill is a late Roman house which was destroyed in that same earthquake, preserving really remarkable domestic assemblages and wall paintings. These attest to the affluent lifestyle of these late Roman Sardians, a very different picture from the frequent claim that the cities of Asia Minor were in steep economic decline in the 6th and 7th centuries. Another of our priorities, then, is to learn more about these houses, which form a sort of late Roman Pompeii, and their domestic assemblages and their wall paintings preserved by the disaster, and to learn more about this earthquake that brought an end to urban occupation in ancient Sardis. In 2017, we completed excavation of two irregular, rather plain rooms, which nevertheless produced an interesting assemblage of artifacts three hanging lamps suspended from bronze chains, a pottery flask, iron locks, horse trappings, bronze weights, and other artifacts, the contents of the room at the moment that the earthquake struck, or one of the earthquakes. These rooms had been cut through in the late sixth century by a great drain which led out through the terrace wall and eventually led to that street. And this solved a, num a couple of mysteries and again suggests large-scale urban infrastructure projects still going on in the late sixth century. Last summer, we expanded the excavations guided in part by a geophysical survey done by that same professor at 9th of September, Mahmoud Drahor, in 2001. And you can see how the, here how the results from magnetometry and resistivity and other techniques are not nearly as informative as the radar survey we used last summer. But nonetheless, they did help us plan the excavation. And conversely, testing the geophysical results through excavation helps us better understand that survey. So there we are. Francis Gallart Marquez, now here at Harvard, and Jessica Plant of Cornell University excavated parts of two rooms here. Francis's seems to have been a second courtyard with a marble pavement and a platform or fountain or something largely robbed out. Its walls, too, were painted in imitation of colorful marble revetment, similar to the rooms at the south, although unfortunately not as well preserved. You can see how the wall in the lower left has been dramatically split by the earthquake and the two pieces offset, like some of the things that you see in California. Um, um, it's notable that Francis found no evidence of the organized earthquake collapse that's so distinct, extinct, distinctive elsewhere, and my guess is that the pavement was robbed out and everything was sort of mixed up sometime after the earthquake. The wall that separated these true rooms had just fallen flat into Jessica's trench and lay almost pre perfectly preserved on the floor of the room. It had three arched windows in it, which would have made this room a comfortable and well-lit space. We had hoped, as we, after lifting this wall, to find the same kinds of rich assemblages of artifacts on the floors underneath. But here, too, in contrast with the rooms previously dug, um, the contrast is very great. The floors were bare, probably abandoned, and emptied out before the earthquake. This collapsed wall, however, was built with spolia from the early Roman sanctuary, including parts of a draped female statue and a monumental Latin inscription, which will provide, we hope, further evidence for the early Roman sanctuary. Deep excavation under these Roman levels haven't yet clarified earlier buildings. Well, the sanctuary of the imperial cult in Field 55 was one of Sardis's most important urban sanctuaries. The other was the sanctuary of Sibylle, which has never been found, but whose antiblocks and sculptures were found reused in the synagogue, by the way. The other major sanctuary of Sardis, however, was not located within the city, but outside it, about a kilometer and a half or so, up the Pactolus River. The Temple of Artemis has been the great landmark of the site since antiquity. Early travelers studied and painted and photographed the two columns that have always stood there. But it was Howard Crosby Butler of Princeton University who undertook the first large-scale excavations at Sardis just before World War I at the invitation of Osman Hamdi Bey, the founder and director of the, archaeological, um, the Istanbul Archaeological Museum. The Temple of Artemis is the fourth largest Ar Ar Ionic temple in the world and was published and was excavated and published by Butler in rather record time. 
But in the centuries since Butler's excavation, the temple had turned dark and ugly, stained by black cyanobacteria and crusty lichen, which not only discolored the stone, but also eat it away, causing permanent damage. And when a conservator at the Metropolitan Museum, Michael Morris, suggested that we could clean the biogrowth from the temple, I initially scoffed, envisioning um, crews scrubbing these marble blocks with toothbrushes. But he developed a new technique for killing the microorganism that infest these marble blocks and cause the damage. And in 2014, the Kaplan Fund of New York offered a generous five-year grant to clean the temple. The process is slow and deliberately low tech, using a common, safe, and commercially available biocide to kill the bacteria and lichen. By leaving this to bake in the sun for a few days, the biocide seeps deeply into the stone, killing not only the surface colonies, but also the bacteria that have entered the crystalline structure of the marble. It's therefore much more long-lasting. Um, over the years, we've tried lots of different methods of cleaning marble, and after a few years, it turn, starts turning gray again. But now, at the end of this project, after um, seven years of experimentation, even the first test blocks that they did um, uh, in those first years remain clean and free of regrowth. So we anticipate that if we monitor and spray the temple with biocide every couple years, we'll be able to maintain its condition and not have to do this all over again. In 2017 and 2018, we focused on the most challenging parts, the standing columns of the, of the East Peristyle. And when we began this project, we employed for the first time uh, women in our field crews. And initially, we were quite, everybody uh, were, was, was somewhat dubious about this, and especially about women working on scaffolding. But after five years, they've taken the project completely into their own hands. They assemble the scaffolding around the columns, work fearlessly six stories above the ground, and take great pride in having returned the temple to its former rich glow. As I've said before, this has been one of the most satisfying projects for me at Sardis, and it's been very important as well to the team of 15 or so workmen and men, women and men who have brought the project now to a successful conclusion. They worked under very difficult circumstances on vertiginous scaffolding, and they made sure that every aspect of the project was a success and speak with real pride about their work. And now, looking back at the old photos, like the one from 1965, it's hard to believe that it was so dark and ugly. Um, and it's hard for us to remember what it looked like back then, so we left the top of one of the columns deliberately uncleaned to demonstrate this transformation and remind us. The Ministry of Culture had asked us to move four displaced column capitals from the Temple of Artemis into a new protective stoa. After making sure that this could be done safely, we completed this in 2017. And that was fine. It had the added benefit, however, of allowing us to study the undersides of the capitals, which had never been seen before, or not since Butler. I should mention here that the temple has two main phases. The cella and the internal colonnade were built in the Hellenistic era, 280 BC to about 200 BC. And the exterior columns were not built until the Roman period, about the first century AD or the second. The capitals that we moved were Hellenistic, and that's shown by the lifting cuttings on the top surfaces, which are characteristic of that period of masonry. Um, and so they originally belonged to the interior colonnade of the building. However, they were not found in the cella. Two of them were found in the east porch there where they had been reused in the Roman period, and you see one of them in Butler's photo up there. The other two um, were found elsewhere. Now, architecture geeks like myself can see evidence of this reuse in the cuttings on their undersides. The round cuttings in the middle are for the original Hellenistic dowels, which hold one block to the next below it while the two square cuttings on either side were cut by Roman builders when they reused the capitals in this new position in the, um, in, in the eastern porch. The other capitals, though, including two of them that we moved and also the famous one in the Metropolitan Museum in New York, were found far from any standing column. The capitals have that same original round dowel there, but, they don't, but now that we've seen their undersides for the first time, they all lack the Roman dowels. I conclude, therefore, that when the Romans cleared the cella, they reused a few of the columns in the new porches, but they had lots of capitals left over, which were never set up, or they would have those Roman dowels. 
Instead, I think they were set up perhaps around the sanctuary as monuments of the skill and artistry of the, or the original builders of the temple, collected in something of the same way that we know that the Romans collected sculptures and inscriptions of earlier eras, Lydian inscriptions that they probably couldn't read, um, and reset them in memorial monuments around the precinct. The Roman Sardians, so interested in their own antiquity, created a sort of a museum in their sanctuary to display the history of their temple and its ancient inscriptions and sculptures and the beautiful capitals. Well, another sector of work combines excavation with site conservation and presentation. At the western side of the city, Professor Hanfmann had excavated and restored the Bath Gymnasium complex with a synagogue in its southeast corner. This is, as I said, the largest synagogue in the ancient world, richly paved with mosaics and its walls decorated with panels of colored marble revetment. They were built along the main road into Sardis, which was lined by a sort of shopping mall, the Byzantine shops. During the 1980s and 90s, as I mentioned, Professor Greenwalt's work focused on the Lydian fortification across the street and on a gate in that fortification, which lies under the late Roman road, a wonderful indication of the continuity of Sardis, that the Romans were still using the same path that the Lydians had used a thousand years earlier. Our work in this quarter of the city began with a site conservation project. The mosaics of the synagogue had been conserved according to the best practices of the 1960s by lifting them and resetting them in reinforced concrete. On the one hand, this makes them very stable. So this is one of the few buildings where you can actually walk on the ancient mosaics and experience the building from the perspective of a Roman. On the other hand, 40 years of rain and snow and heat have damaged the mosaics and they've begun to crack and split. While the conservators have spent months repairing them, they assure us that the damage will continue if they are not protected by some sort of a shelter. The mud brick fortification across the street has always been under a, te a temporary protective roof ever since it's been excavated. So nobody, not even members of the expedition, can see this most monumental structure of Lydian Sardis. These two projects then, have been a very important part of our operations in Turkey and in the US for the past 10 years and longer. And I'm delighted to report that we're approaching our goal. The design for the shelter over the synagogue was given final approval by the Turkish Ministry of Culture last year, a long and complex process, and we can now begin fundraising for this important building. Once the building is protected under a shelter, we will begin a program to conserve the mosaics and restore them to the state in which they were excavated. The mud brick fortification is even more challenging. There is no such structure anywhere in the world in this climate, so we have no experience or guidelines on how to do this. But the conservators and architects and engineers have come up with excellent designs, and next summer we'll continue our tests on full-scale mock-ups of the wall, do experiments in mud brick construction to protect this unique monument. These two roofing projects, as I say, are most, among the most challenging and important projects we're engaged in at the moment, and I could spend hours discussing them, but I won't. Um, but they also are financially challenging, and so I'm particularly happy to um, announce this evening that we, that we are hoping to be, get, be able to build the shelter for the Lydian fortification thanks to an extraordinarily generous bequest from William Collins Kohler. Kohler was a student in the classics department at Harvard in the early 60s, and he worked at Sardis with his wife Elaine from 1961 to 1963. He excavated on the Acropolis at sectors Hob and PN and was scheduled to publish the mosaics from the site. His sister Julili is here in part to help move this process along and see that her brother's wishes are carried out as he would have wanted, and I want to thank her for her tireless, tireless efforts on his and on Sardis's behalf. But while we plan the protective measures for the synagogue and Lydian fortification, we've been working on the intermediate zone where the Roman road meets the Lydian gate. We wanted to expand excavations both to understand the juncture of all these buildings and also to make the complex built remains more easily understood by visitors by leading people from the synagogue to the ancient road, explain the long history of the road from at least 700 BC until about 600 AD, and so lead them back in time to the Lydian fortification and gate. 
This supposedly simple project was made complicated by the unexpected discovery by Genjai Uzturk in 2014 of an enormous pile of marble blocks just beyond, just at the limits of where Hanfmann and Greeny both stopped digging. It's very frustrating. Um, Phil Stinson and Brianna Bricker and Baha Yildirim studied these blocks and found that many of them were voussoir blocks from an arch whose, di whose diameter could be measured at some 13 meters. And further excavation uncovered the corresponding foundations on the other side of the, of the Marble Avenue, just 13 meters away, and so exactly fitting these large voussoirs, and with the same chamfered piers and so forth. And this allowed us to reconstruct with some certainty a monumental Roman arch spanning the colonnaded avenue here just at the entrance to the city. The 13 meter central span is the widest known in the Roman world. I show here for comparison the Arch of Titus in Rome. And we see now that the, this western entrance to the city was dominated by a, this enormous structure greeting visitors from Smyrna and the coast and the 3D model, or the, the, the 3D print here will be, which is done by Kelly Anna Luludis of the Graduate School of Design, will be on display over at the um, um, reception afterwards. In 2017, we completed excavation of these fallen blocks, and John Sigmeyer of Pennsylvania, of UPenn, discovered the south wall of the, of the avenue for the first time. It's, measure, it, it's 100 feet wide. The colonnade on the south had been paved with mosaics, but those had been really battered by industrial activity in the late Roman era. He found parts of two symmetrical, but rather um, enigmatic buildings entered by steps and, and paved with marble, which had been largely robbed out. We also knew for a long time that the Roman avenue was, paved, was, was flanked by colonnades and that these were paved with mosaics whose geometric patterns resembled those of the synagogue. Small areas were excavated in the 1960s, but we've always kept them covered with gravel to protect them from traffic since the mosaics have never been lifted and so, like the ones in the synagogue, and so they wouldn't stand up to foot traffic. In 2017, though, we uncovered a small area of mosaic where the sidewalk led through one of the side vaults of the arch, and it turned out that the mosaic had never been uncovered. I suppose at the time, in 1963, they were dealing with so many mosaics in the synagogue, they just didn't want another conservation project. To our surprise, the mosaic bore an inscription recording the patron's name. It says that the most magnificent count of consular rank Flavius Myonius paved the sidewalk. The name of the man responsible for this project is derived from the ancient Homeric name of this region, Myonia. This is apparently a local boy made good. We know nothing else about this man or when he lived, but the corresponding mosaics on the other side of the street are dated by coins to the late 6th century, a period when one might not expect major projects to update the urban infrastructure. In 63, Long before we recognized that there was a monumental arch here, archaeologists had discovered this enigmatic feature. We've got lots of those. Um, the so-called packed columns area, a solid packing of layer upon layer of marble column shafts set in cement. When we discovered the arch, we hypothesized that these could be a repair or reinforcement of its north pier, buttressing the foundations which might have become a little unstable. And we associated that repair with a late antique building inscription, which was found here in 1970, recording that someone named Myonius had obeyed and executed skillfully a mighty foundation which is stronger than something or other. It must be the same Myonius, and the date of the repair, according to coins from the Pack Columns area, also is the late 6th century. So we can hypothesize here a major urban renewal project in which the arch was repaired, the mosaics renewed, and, um, and all in the late 6th. Just like in Field 55, this region of the city in the late 6th century seems to have been a complex mix of abandoned or repurposed spaces and vibrant progressive life, urban life and renewal making large investments in this infrastructure. And like at Field 55, this was all brought to naught in a relatively short time. The arch collapsed in a massive earthquake. This is clear from the way the blocks fell, their keystones embedded in the marble pavement just below the apex of the arch. 
This earthquake is dated by coins of Phocas to the early 7th century, and it must be the same earthquake that brought down the south portico and the synagogue field 55 and the temple of Artemis, for that matter, all destroyed in the same way at the same time. Sardis, of course, had been utterly demolished by earthquakes in the past, like the one in 17 AD, but at that time, the Roman imperial government offered aid and relief, and within a generation or two, Sardis was largely rebuilt. This time, the collapse left the major road through Sardis, the highway from the coast to inner Anatolia, blocked with rubble, and the Temple of Artemis, um, houses in Field 55, and other buildings, uh, piles of of, of rubble. To return to that mosaic, how can we preserve and display it? We couldn't lift it and reset it in cement, as was the common practice in the 60s, and we didn't really want to rebury it as we've reburied the rest of the sidewalk. Luckily, the American embassy in Ankara came to our rescue with a two-year grant to preserve and protect the mosaic and the Lydian Gate nearby. The plan is to cover the mosaic with a glass floor, which will serve as both a viewing platform for the mosaic and the remains of the arch and gate and other features. This was designed and permission granted by the Kurul, and we will start building in a couple weeks. Well, a few weeks. A team of conservators and women, veterans of the temple cleaning project, took um, took on the massive cleaning of the mosaic. Many of the tesserae were like loose teeth and had to be remortared into place. Others were covered with concretion as hard as rock, obscuring the original color and pattern. They worked with brushes and dental tools and other hand tools, and these sufficed for much of it, but some parts were covered with you know, a thick layer of concrete-like um, 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 uh, uh, calcium, more than the dental tools could easily penetrate, and the tesserae were so loose that we kept uh, destroying those and doing more damage than good. A real lifesaver came with the generous donation in 2017 by Ed Teppo, a specialist in laser technology, of a Linton Phoenix conservation laser. This cutting, and Tony Siegel here was very, was, was responsible for this. This cutting edge technology is used in high-end museums around the world, like the Strauss, but rarely on archaeological sites, and conservators Tony Siegel and Carol Snow in particular arranged for the manufacturer to send one to us. It took many months of Baja's labor and the help of three ministries to get it through customs into Turkey, but it finally arrived to, in time to be invaluable in cleaning the mosaic, and you can see in the video over there, or maybe it's done, you can see how it's blasting little tiny bits of, of stuff off of the white tessery. Um, the conservators used it to clean the tessery without damage, safely and effectively, in a fraction of the time it would have taken to do it by hand. It's also invaluable in the lab for cleaning metal and stone artifacts. The Lydian Gate had been excavated in the 70s and 80s, and despite regular cleaning, it quickly turns into a jungle. The scarps eroded and collapsed. And archaeologist Genjai Uzturk of Ege University spent last summer cleaning and consolidating this sector, also with the help of the Kaplan Grant, resetting stones that had collapsed, supporting the trench scarps with dry stone walls of local schist, and doing a great deal of research in, in how to restore this to its original excavated uh, situation. And it now looks um, uh, far, far better. As you can see, this is a really confusing area. And despite our ongoing program of signage and reconstruction drawings, I think that most visitors will walk away perplexed by centuries of monumental buildings, all of them intersecting right here. One way to make this part of Sardis more easily understood by visitors is an augmented reality app that we are just now beginning to think about developing. This will, we hope, allow visitors to use their own smartphones to superimpose reconstructions of these buildings on the existing remains as they look through the camera. And this technology, of course, is becoming more and more familiar, think Pokemon Go or Ikea, but also with many architectural and scientific and engineering applications. And this, I hope, will allow visitors to immerse themselves in the ancient experience of these structures without physically reconstructing the remains, which we can't do. Architects Kellyanna Luludis and Zhao Sheng and others have spent countless hours making these 3D models with the help of Brianna Bricker, Marcus Routman, and archaeologists. And Kellyanna did her graduate, her thesis at the GSD here on roofing and presentation of these remains.
So these models we, will, we hope, be the basis of what will be a new way of experiencing and learning about ancient Sardis. You all know that excavation is only the beginning of the process, and I'm sorry, I will finish. Um, most people at the, on the Sardis staff are involved with recording and study and publication of the archaeological results rather than excavation, and this process consumes the rest of the year. People sometimes get the impression that archaeologists just work in the summer, but we all know that we work year-round, and it takes many months of research and writing to understand and publish the results of one excavation season. Among our research projects is a study of all the human bones from excavations at Sardis. Until recently, Turkish regulations required that all of those bones be sent to Ankara University for study. However, in 2015, we were given permission to return the human remains of about 500 individuals from about 50 years of excavation, dating from the early Bronze Age through the medieval period, um, back to Sardis. It's a good, but not honestly a great population sample, but it, we're now in a, in a position to get a much better picture of the human population of Sardis than ever before. One of the projects undertaken by Yilmaz Erdal of Hajet Tepe University and his students was a particularly cold case left over from excavations in 1966 in a Lydian tumulus in Bintepe. The tomb had been looted by modern robbers, but archaeologists found not a Lydian burial, but a group of late Roman skeletons, 150 or so, as well as lamps and other finds. We wondered what had caused the burial of so many people in late antiquity reusing an ancient Lydian tomb. Could they be victims of a plague that swept the late Roman Empire or um, victims of violence? Um, the bones were never properly studied, and so all we had were the preliminary notes. Yilmaz's team found at least 92 individuals. We're not sure what the discrepancy between 92 and 150 was. There's no evidence of trauma on the bones, so they don't seem to have died in a violent event. And the relatively small numbers of children and elderly individuals seems to rule out the plague, which tends to disproportionately affect the old and the young. We did take samples for bacterial DNA, which we hope to study here at the, at the, um, at the Reich Laboratory, and we hope will confirm or disprove this conclusion. Instead, this seems to have been a, a multiple burial used over a period of time by some local population rather than a mass burial in one event. And yet, as Yilmaz Bey says, the skeletons were gracile rather than robust. They show few signs of heavy physical labor. As Yilmaz Bey describes it, they're more like us, more like us tender-footed academics spending our lives in armchairs rather than our workmen who labor in the fields and develop strong muscles and robust bones. And I found that surprising. Today, Bintepe is an agricultural territory. There's no cities there, and we've always believed that this was true in antiquity as well. Were they inhabitants of some small town nearby? Or maybe Sardis itself, continuing in some way the ancient practice by which Sardian elites buried their dead in the ancestral cemetery across the valley at Bintepe. I don't want to speculate like this, but it is exciting to see new results and ideas emerge from excavations of decades ago, and also to see that these ideas are now testable through DNA, carbon-14, and strontium isotope analysis, which we hope to do in the future. We're very, very fortunate to have a full-time staff at Harvard directed by Baha Yildirim. One of their main goals is to bring to publication the manuscripts and studies that so many scholars have been working on at Sardis for so many years. For the past couple years, this effort was led by Teresa Huntsman and Brianna Bricker. They made remarkable progress with many manuscripts. They published, as, um, um, as Mark said, Jane Evans' coin volume, now available from Harvard University Press and also for free download on our site, uh, our website. We are also making this into a searchable coin database available online, which we hope will make, the, make this more accessible and useful to scholars all over the world. This is, I think, the largest database of coins from an archaeological context in the world, and we'll link it to other major coin databases like the ANS. Last year, Teresa and Brianna left Cambridge, and although they're both still working on Sardis publications, we are delighted to welcome Carrie Sullivan as research, research editor to oversee the publications project. 
She spent many years overseeing the publications of the American School of Classical Studies in Athens with such books as Dinsmore's Propylia volume. Within the next weeks, we shall hope to see Professor Georg Petzl's publication of the inscriptions of Sardis found since 1958. And this will bring to conclusion the work of many of the world's great epigraphers, Louis Robert, Philippe Gautier, and Peter Hermann. For the first time, we're publishing with a Turkish press, Ege Yayan Lada, which will produce, we think, higher quality books much more affordably than, this, than the press we've been using. And this, of course, will be available on the website and on the database. Next in line is Tikret Yegul's Temple of Artemis, a project that he's worked on for 30 years now, um, which will be a another monumental program. And finally, the study of the sector's House of Bronzes and Pactolus Cliff. Pactolus Cliff has gone on for even longer. Originally planned to be published by Gus Swift, the publication was given to Andrew Ramage after Swift passed away in 1976. They've worked on this since the 19, since the since 76, as I said, and our ideas, of course, have changed greatly, but that makes it in some ways even more interesting since we know very little about um, suburbs of ancient cities. And we're bringing to final publication the Synagogue of Sardis, another of the site's most famous monuments, which Andy Seeger has been working on for many years. He, too, is joined by younger scholars, Marcus Routman, Jane Evans, and Vanessa Rousseau, to bring this complicated project to fruition. And this is one of the real joys of working at Sardis. Not just the joy of making new discoveries, of adding to scientific knowledge and all that, but sharing these discoveries with and training the younger generation. Each year, a few dozen graduate and undergraduate students take part in the excavations and gain unique training in many different aspects of archaeology. And while we enjoy their expertise and energy, um, they, I hope, enjoy learning from these experts. Some of these students, like Teoman Yalchinkaya, arrived half a century ago and have stayed involved for most of their adult lives. And I look forward to seeing some of our current students, likewise, remain involved in the project for the next 50 years. These youngsters, of course, are the future of archaeology. And so it's fitting to end with them on this Egemen Likve Chojuk Bayram, the, uh, the, uh, um, the National Sovereignty and Children's Day, a unique Turkish holiday celebrating the foundation of the National Assembly, and then turning it over to the children, to the next generation. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I know, we're late. We're late. <clears throat> Thank you, Nick. That was a really, a really thrilling presentation. We've got time for just a couple of questions. There should be microphones circulating, so just raise your hand if you have a question. Uh, since none of the archaeologists are asking, I'll ask as a biologist uh, a question about uh, an area which I don't know anything about. So thank you very much for this lecture. And uh, so I, I wanted you to comment about enhanced uh, reality in, in using that augmented reality to experience an archaeological site. I think that's, 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 that's great news on one hand, very depressing news on the other. Very depressing news? Yes. Would that, do you think would that replace over time the efforts to really reconstruct some of the, this magnificent structures? I hope it's not depressing. <laughs> I think, it, I think it, it offers lots of possibilities. We have, for instance, if you think of a, an arch 24 or 29 meters high falling down, it's going to make a much larger pile of rocks than we've got. We could never, ever reconstruct that in, in reality. And I can't, I, we, we thought of various ways of, of doing it physically. I would love to do something physically. You know, I, that's, that's wonderful. But, but the, um, a virtual thing, first of all, it is, it's, it's, very, it's flexible. So that our, our ideas change all the time. Every year we do a new, a slightly different reconstruction. And so you aren't committing to bricks and mortar. Um, 
It also is, uh, it's, there's a lot that we don't know about Sardis. In fact, most of what, most, we don't know most things about Sardis. And, I, and what I'm hoping is that our, is that our, um, um, our presentation, our, our augmented reality, will not present something that's sort of photorealistic that makes it feel like you are there, but will be sort of ghostly. And there's this Italian artist named Eduardo Tresoldi who does real physical reconstructions of basilicas and, and ancient buildings that are only standing that high, um, but he does them in mesh. And they're very, very beautiful, especially at night. And that's the sort of aesthetic and ghostliness and, um, um, and, 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 and slight in, indeterminateness that, I would, that, I'm ho that I'm hoping that we can convey in this, that we're, not, we're giving an impression rather than a, a, a physical reconstruction. It also, will allow people to visit Sardis who are not living in Turkey or in Western Turkey, so it'll be available all over the world and you can wander through it. The, the Peabody Museum here has a great application um, by these same people, and they're, they're, we've worked with people that we're thinking about working with at least, um, where you can visit the Sphinx, and I love to visit, you know, it's, very, very, it's great to wa walk around the Sphinx um, in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, and, um, and finally, I think it's gonna engage the young people in a way that, I mean, that's, that is too bad in a way, but they like these phones, and, but, and that's a way of getting at them. Um, and, and we hope that people will see Sardis from, long, from, from a long ways away and get interested in it and you know, that that will affect them in that way. So I think there's lots of, of potential in it. And um, I'm not in any way opposed to, recon, to physical reconstruction, but it's, it's, it's expensive and, it's, and it's also, it, has dis, it has real disadvantages too. I feel we have time for only one final question. Oh, I see this, a hand raised. There's a hand there. I was fascinated by how you got the columns cleaned with <laughs> bio biologists and your own. Um, on some of the slides, they looked orange from the sun, but was that because they were so white? that they reflected the orange from a sunset or a sunrise? The orange comes from this, in, this horrible scum from the biocide and all the bacteria and lichen and, and guck that is being washed off the columns. And actually when they tried this technique the first time on just a test, uh, just a, a, a random test block, not a beautiful column capital or something, it, they said it was a total failure because it turned the block this blotchy, gray, orange, brown color. And then when they came back, when Michael came back six months later, it had finished killing the bacteria and it was beautiful. And that's actually one of these sort of wonderful transformations that we don't really see. We can't really see how beautiful it is until the next year. Um, and that I think is, it's, it's sort of satisfying in a way that it's not something that happens instantly like the laser, but takes some time to mature and rise and develop. So, yeah, that's what's happening, I think. Thank you. I'm afraid it's time to draw these proceedings to an end, but I want to thank, first of all, everyone who's come out tonight to hear the presentation, but above all, Professor Nick Cahill for this wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you.